Hello, let's talk about partial pressure of CO2 derangements. Here are the learning objectives for this short session. We're going to list the causes of hypercapnia, predict changes in PCO2 based on changes in respiratory rate and tidal volume, explain how dead space causes hypercapnia, and then describe the effects of hypocapnia and hypercapnia on pulmonary, cardiovascular, and cerebral blood flow. But before we start that, let's talk about minute ventilation. As a reminder, minute ventilation is respiratory rate times tidal volume. And tidal volume can be broken up into two portions. You have the dead space volume and you have the alveolar volume. Now remember, it's in the alveolar volume that ventilation occurs. I want to just go over a few abbreviations before we continue. Tidal volume is equal to VT, dead space volume is equal to VD, and alveolar volume is equal to VA. Now let's look at tidal volume in a different way. Tidal volume is equal to the dead space volume plus the alveolar volume. In minute ventilation, now minute ventilation is abbreviated VE with a little dot over it, is equal to dead space ventilation plus alveolar ventilation. And the ventilations are abbreviated with the dots as well. This indicates that the respiratory rate is multiplied times the volume. Okay, let's go back to the learning objectives. Let's list the causes of hypercapnia. You can break this up into two subcategories. You have decreased removal of PCO2, and you have increased production of PCO2. Now let's go back to decreased removal of PCO2. You can have decreased minute ventilation that causes that. And I think of two ways that you have decreased minute ventilation. The first way is patients who won't breathe. The most obvious example of this would be a patient who is in the operating room who you've paralyzed and sedated. They're not going to breathe unless you breathe for them. And then there are patients who can't breathe. A classic example of this would be a patient with a neuromuscular disorder who is just too weak to breathe, or a patient with a spinal cord injury who can't trigger things, or even a patient who is obese who is struggling to breathe to get past that extrinsic resistance. The other way you have decreased removal of PCO2 is increased dead space, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a second. With regards to increased production of CO2, this is only going to be a problem if the minute ventilation doesn't rise to match the rise in PCO2. And this does happen, particularly when patients are sick who are already struggling to meet their minute ventilation. This can occur with fever, sepsis, exercise, or overfeeding. In the ICU, we'll see this when we have a ventilated patient or a mechanically ventilated patient who's paralyzed and sedated, and they all of a sudden get a fever or they get even sicker, and their PCO2 will rise just because the body is producing more carbon dioxide. Now let's go to the next learning objective. Predict changes in PCO2 based on changes in respiratory rate and tidal volume. Let's do a thought problem. How would the PCO2 change in a patient after being injected with a 10 times overdose of morphine? Now this is a classic example, right? Patients who are overdose on morphine are just less likely to breathe. But let's go into it in detail. Minute ventilation is equal again to respiratory rate times tidal volume. And in patients who are injected with morphine, their tidal volumes go down, and their respiratory rates go down, and then their minute ventilations go down. This is even more so of a problem because opiates decrease the activity of the chemoreceptors that are located in the medulla. And because this happens, the PCO2 is going to rise even more and more, and the body's just not going to care. Let's now move on to the next learning objective. Explain how dead space causes hypercapnia. And I like to do it as a thought experiment. How would the PCO2 change if Dr. Stevenson's neck and thorax, which he likes to call strong and sturdy, and I like to think of as short, grew, but his minute ventilation remained the same? Well, let's even do better than just a thought experiment. Let's do an experiment with Dr. Stevenson's puppet. Well, let's see. Oh my. Oh my. I'm feeling like it's getting harder and harder to catch my breath. Now, here's the problem. His PCO2 is going up. But how can you explain that with the dead space problem? Now, remember, minute ventilation is equal to the dead space ventilation and the alveolar ventilation. And in this case, because his neck and thorax grew to normal size, but his minute ventilation was unchanged, 
that meant that his alveolar ventilation had to go down. And if your alveolar ventilation goes down, which is let be usually because of an increase in dead space, your PCO2 goes up. Let's think about it another way. Here's your respiratory tract. And within your respiratory tract, you have alveolar capillary units that are here. And ventilation only occurs at the alveolar capillary units. It doesn't occur in the dead space. Now you're probably thinking, why did we spend all that time just talking about dead space ventilation and occurring when Dr. Stevenson neck grows to normal size? The truth is, is that I spent $100 on a puppet and wanted to use it. And you're probably right that if someone's anatomic dead space increases, they're going to overall compensate for that and maintain their alveolar ventilation by increasing their total minute ventilation. But in sick patients, they're not always able to increase their total minute ventilation to maintain their alveolar ventilation. And as their dead space ventilation goes up, their alveolar ventilation goes down. This classically occurs in COPD and also in asthma. It can also happen in other disease processes, but these are the ones we think of most commonly. Now, let's describe the effects of hypocapnia and hypercapnia on pulmonary, cardiovascular, and cerebral blood flow. And let's do it again with the help from our puppet, Dr. Stevenson. You know what happens when your PCO2 increases? Tell me. Well, an increase in PCO2 increases cer cer cerebri cer cer cerebr cerebral blood flow and cardiovascular blood flow, but decreases pulmon pulmonary blood flow because PCO2 increases PVR. Now, let's review the learning objectives we've had. We've listed the causes of hypercapnia. We've predicted changes in PCO2 based on changes in respiratory rate and tidal volume. We've explained how dead space causes hypercapnia. And we just heard from my daughter Scout and Dr. Stevenson's puppet about how hypercapnia affects pulmonary, cardiovascular, and cerebral blood flow. With regards to hypocapnia, it does the exact opposite. For example, when we have patients with traumatic brain injury or increased cerebral pressure, we try to decrease their cerebral blood flow. And we do this by hyperventilating them to decrease their PCO2. And with that, we've covered the derangements in PCO2 and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Okay, go for it, Scout. Hi, Dr. Stevenson. How are you doing today? Oh, well, kids, I'm just fine. Just here working on my own personal brand. What are you studying today? The letter C, the letter O, and the number two. Dr. Stevenson, do you mind if we peek under that goatee of yours? My dad has always wondered what you're hiding. 